Our triumphant realization from the previous video was the angular frequency of a mass on a spring depends on two things. I guess it depends on how much mass we've got on the spring and it depends on how much the spring is springy or tough. This could be called the toughness of the spring. Let's look at this equation, make sure it's reasonable. <clears throat> As we put more and more mass on a given spring, this says that the angular frequency will decrease. I think that's reasonable because it has more inertia and more of a tendency to keep doing what it's doing, so it will take a longer time for it to, ooh, we're hinting at time. We should probably go to time pretty soon. Anyway, it will take, it will less often be back to where it started in terms of frequency. Now, uh, the K, if we have a greater spring constant, then that means that there's a greater restoring force getting that mass back to where it started from. Let's just get this a little bit uh, serious for ourselves. We could hang a mass from a spring and pull it down, and a greater mass means that omega will decrease, and a tighter spring means that omega will increase. Reasonable, and that it happens as a square root is a beautiful fact of nature. So the next thing that I can do is I can remind you of the relationship between period and omega. I think we found that period is, ooh, it's got omega in it, and it's got two pi in it, right? I think it's two pi divided by omega, and we can get that equation pretty simply from the equation that defines omega. Omega is two pi over period. So we see that that's the case, but we know now that omega is root k over m. So we can write down the period of a mass on a spring is two pi times the root of m over k. Now this says, this maybe this language is a little more comfortable, as the mass increases, the period to get back to where it started will also increase, and as the spring gets tougher, the time that it takes to get back to where it started will decrease. All right, cool. And we also have three equations, and I'll write in their full form. This is position as a function of time. I don't mean position times time, but it's position as a function of time. It's the amplitude times the cosine, and we're kind of just choosing cosine arbitrarily. We could have chosen sine also. It just depends on where we decide to start the mass. So we're deciding to start the mass at a high position of A. So we've got the cosine of omega times T, but that is the root of K over M times T. Don't screw that T. All right, and we also know that velocity as a function of time is, ooh, we got an omega out front, right? And we know what omega is, so let's, uh, let's go crazy. It's gonna be mm -hmm, negative a times the square root of k over m times the sine of the square root of k over m times t. Put that in parentheses right there. And then and we, as we went to acceleration, we found this to be still negative. It's just the opposite of the position. And it's got this omega squared in front of it. And omega squared is k over m. So we've got an a, and we've got k over m from the omega square, and then we've got the cosine back again of the root of k over m times the time. With those three equations, we can start to study, as we've seen in a previous video, we can start to study this graph, where I'm graphing potential energy as a function of location where we are, all right? And <clears throat> the potential energy of a mass on a spring, well, the potential energy of a mass on a spring is one half k x square. And so it's this parabola shape that we've been anticipating. Mm -hmm. That is a very, very bad green. I think I'll just throw it away. There it is, in the trash. Now, this parabola is showing the potential energy as a function of location, but if I pull the spring back to some distance x, away from, this is equilibrium, away from its equilibrium to some distance x, this would be called x max, but maybe a better name for x max now? Can you think of it? Check it out. A better name for x max is the amplitude. So if we pull the spring back to some amplitude, then we've given the system this energy. We've said, yeah, the potential energy is this. I guess the potential energy is one half k 
k times a squared. Don't you agree? 1 half k times x max squared is when it's pulled all the way back here. So that energy, there's no kinetic when we let go, so that energy will stay the same and it will be conserved, assuming no frictional losses. And this point right here, well, remember, we pull something back and it goes really fast when it reaches equilibrium and it begins to slow down just past equilibrium, slows down, slows down, and stops over here. So this location is also important. We could call this a turning point. I think this is a little bit review for you. And this is another toilet paper over here, I mean turning point. And this location is probably similar to A, it's probably negative A, okay? But at this moment right here, I'm going to say that this is the potential energy at some given location. That's, call it location one. That's the potential energy right there because this is a graph of potential energy. Now, <clears throat> I can ask the question, what is this amount of energy? And I hope that you'll be able to tell me that potential plus kinetic equals zero. Right? No, sorry, just kidding. Potential plus kinetic is one half k a squared. Notice that a doesn't depend on where the thing is. A is just the maximum location, the greatest elongation. So this will be, well, this is the potential energy at location one. And up here, this, let me get my right color. Oh yeah, pink, good. This is the kinetic energy at location one. And it'll move around, just as we've seen before, having that potential and the kinetic. And my goal right now is to write down what the total energy is as a function of time. Check this out. The total energy as a function of time must be one half mv as a function of time Square, we just have to square V, right? That's the kinetic energy. And then we're going to have some potential energy, which is given by 1 half K times X as a function of time, that quantity also squared. So we've got kinetic and potential, and we can plug in these things up here. It's really beautiful algebra. Watch this. We've got 1 half M and then we've got V score. So I need to take, I'm gonna square this as I put it in here. It's gonna be A square times the square of that screw. So that just gives me K divided by M <clears throat> times the sine square, oh boy, the sine square of, I'm gonna just write omega T. You'll see that this is a fantastically beautiful thing, all right? We got omega t right there. And then I need to add on this other term, plus one half k times x squared. So that's gonna be an a square, and I've got the cosine square of omega times t. Now notice what's happening here. This term, the m's will cancel, m and m. And I've got 1 half a squared times k times sine squared of omega t. Here I've got 1 half times k times a squared times cosine squared of omega times t. So if I factor the sucker out, it's gonna be 1 half k a squared times sine square of omega times t square plus cosine square of omega times t. All our time dependence is now inside those brackets and guess what? Regardless of what time is, sine square of some angle plus cosine square of some angle is always one and the grand conclusion is that the energy as a function of time isn't a function of time. It's simply exactly what we started with. That's how the energy stays the same. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful.